Good day. Today it's my privilege to speak about malaria and specifically in pregnancy. We're going to start off by looking at areas where malaria is endemic. It's important to differentiate between halo-endemic areas and meso-endemic areas. Halo-endemic areas, which is depicted in red on the world map, is areas where there's stable transmission, be meaning constant exposure to the, the malaria parasite, where mesoendemic areas is unstable transmission, meaning that there is seasons of malaria or the malaria parasite is not that common. South Africa is a mesoendemic area where uh, malaria is present in Limpopo province as well as Mpumalanga and the northern parts of KwaZulu-Natal. Just a recap on the malaria life cycle. So the vector is the female Anopheles mosquito. Um, the mosquito will bite a, a human, inject the spiros spirozites that will infect the hepatocytes and will multiply, form a schizont, and then rupture. The merozites will then be released into the bloodstream where they will infect erythrocytes. In the erythrocyte cycle, there's two stages, the blood stage, which will, which will cause the clinical disease, and then the sexual stage that will produce the gametocytes, which will then be ingested by the next Anopheles mosquito biting the human. He will um, then ingest the gametocytes. She. She. <laughs> she will then ingest the gametocytes that will produce um, the next cycle of spirozytes in the the mid-gut of the mosquito. You also look at different um, plasmodium species. Um, the most common, most dangerous, especially in pregnancy, would be plasmodium falciparum. Um, and what makes it worse is that plasmodium falciparum infects all red cells. That is why it causes a more severe clinical picture. Plasmodium vivax is the most common, most common species, but doesn't cause severe disease. Plasmodium ovale and malare is less common. It doesn't cause severe disease. Um, and then Plasmodium nolesi will cause severe disease, but is very rare in pregnancy. It's important to notice that Plasmodium vivax and ovale can be dormant in the liver and cause relapse months and years later after infection. So why is malaria such a big issue? 50 million women will be get malaria while or 50 million women in malaria endemic areas become pregnant a year. Half of them live in Africa. Just some food for thought. Um, in Titanic, 1,503 people died. In um, the Twin Towers attack, 2,996 people died. In the tsunami in 2004, 230,000 people died. 10,000 women and 200,000 newborns die every year of malaria. So what is different in pregnancy? Um, first, we'll look at just pregnancy alone increases your risk of, of getting malaria. Um, in Kinshasa, a study showed that um, just being pregnant increases the prevalence of, preg of malaria to 26% compared to the non-pregnant population where it is 6%. The second important factor is intensity of transmission. Again, we look at haloendemic areas and mesoendemic areas. Haloendemic areas means that you have increased exposure, increased immunity, but that also means that you've got milder disease. The median prevalence in a haloendemic area is 28%. In a mesoendemic area, you have less, ex less exposure, less immunity, meaning more severe disease. The median pre prevalence is 1.8% to 17%. Also, it's important to notice that even if you're from a hello endemic area, you move out of that area for some time, the natural immunity wanes quickly, and when you move back to that area, you're just as susceptible as someone that's never lived there before. The third factor that will influence malaria prevalence is gravidity. Prevalence of malaria decreases with an increased gravidity, and that is believed because the, the female will they have immunity, especially to falciparum um, parasites in the placenta and form um, female or immunoglobulins against that specific clone of parasite. So the, it has been shown that you have a two times higher risk of malaria if you're a premigravid 
um, compared to multigravid patients. The other important aspect is placental malaria. So um, it's only Plasmodium falciparum that can cause placental infection. Um, it infects the infected erythrocytes as an ability to adhere and multiply in the placenta. The parasite infected erythrocytes express an antigen, a variant surface antigen 2CA, that's that viral C2A, um, that can connect or adhere to the chondrotium sulfate A um, receptors on the placenta. And as soon as it adheres to the placenta, it can then um, cause an inflammatory response in the placenta that causes fibrin um, deposition and thickening of the placenta, which causes um, decreased placental function. So next, we'll look at clinical presentation. I think the most important thing with malaria is to have a high index of suspicion and not to miss severe malaria. So I'm going to use the WHO classification of severe malaria, and they've got a, a bedside approach to decide what, in which group to, to group the, the patients. Group 1 is a group that will have um, need, immediate care, and especially ICU care, otherwise there's an immediate risk to, to life. Prostation is the inability to sit, stand, walk without assistance, or otherwise referred to as confusion. Um, comatose or cerebral malaria will fit into that, that category. The next is respiratory distress, acidotic breathing, pulmonary edema, metabolic acidosis of hyperlactosemia, shock, anuria, or specific uh, significant upper gestation, uh, <coughs> gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Those are all things that you have to look out for that needs immediate attention. In group two, it's patients that is stable enough to take oral treatment, but they need higher level of care because they can easily deteriorate. And that's a patient with a hemoglobin of less than seven, hematic risk less than 20%, one or more convulsions within 24 hours, hemoglobinuria or black water. They literally get urine that is the color of Coke. Um, jaundice, parasitemia of more than 4%, hypoglycemia or renal impairment. And then there's a third group that will also need parenteral treatment, and they're the group that has such um, bad vomiting that, or persistent vomiting that they, they can't keep the oral treatment in. So that is severe malaria. So the, the classification of malaria will influence your management, and the WHO advises that um, Everybody with severe malaria should be treated ideally in an ICU setting um, with parenteral treatment. Uncomplicated patients or uncomplicated malaria has milder symptoms. The most common symptoms is headache, body ache, fever, chills, sweats, uh, um, fevers and nausea and vomiting, diarrhea and cough. It is usually an ambulant patient with no evidence of organ dysfunction and they have to have a parasite count of less than 4%. The clinical presentation specific in pregnancy, um, pregnant women experience more severe disease, especially hypoglycemia and respiratory complications. There's also an increased risk of developing severe disease or acquiring new infections um, 60 to 70 days postpartum. Another challenging fact is the co-infection of HIV. In, in patients that's co-infected with HIV, they've got an increased risk of malaria acquisition, placental malaria, higher placent parasite load, and more severe clinical disease. Just an interesting fact, malaria comes from the Italian mal area, meaning bad air. The Romans believed that the swamp fumes caused the illness, but it was actually just the mosquitoes living in the swamp areas. The diagnosis of malaria... The, it is still important, as I said, to have a high index of suspicion in any pregnant lady with um, febrile disease that has a history of travel, even if it's just transit or, a transient, transit or a brief stay in a malaria area, should be tested for malaria. So what is most commonly used is the thick and a thin smear. The thick smear is lysed blood, red blood cells. Um, it's a good screening test. It's either positive or negative. And um, you look at paras you can comment on the parasite density. While the thin smear is a fixed red blood cells in a single layer, and it, 
you can specify which species it is under the microscope, and, um, it, but it requires more time to read, and a low-density infection could be missed on a thin smear. PCR is the gold standard to identify malaria, but due to um, cost and training constraints, it's rarely used. Um, it, it then detects submicroscopic malaria. And then placental malaria, you might present with it, um, peripheral smear negative patient that has placental malaria on the placental histology. There's no good peripheral biomarker to diagnose placental malaria, so you'll have to do placental histology. Then the rapid diagnostic test, test that is used um, often in, in Africa, is a, it's readily available and it's a quick result and it's easy to use and interpret. The disadvantage is that it only works for um, P. falciparum and P. vivax and it could have a false negative and low parasite density. It's also an antigen test, so it might still be positive despite um, treatment, because it will still pick up the, the antigen. And the rapid diagnostic tests are specifically used in intermittent um, screening and treatment in patients in um, endemic areas. Um, the rapid diagnostic test can never replace microscopy, but it can be added to, so you still need microscopy to make the diagnosis um, in most patients. Okay, the outcome of um, of malaria and pregnancy. Still, again, we differentiate between stable transmission areas where you'll have an asymptomatic mother, but with still an increased risk of anemia and low birth weight. In unstable transmission area, you have more severe disease, preterm birth, preterm birth and um, increased maternal and fetal mortality rates. So poor prognostic factors for malaria and pregnancy is low parity, young maternal age, Immune, Im, non-immune immunological status, P. falciparum or P. vivax, high degree of parasitemia, placental infection, socioeconomic background, place of residency, meaning either if the woman stays in rural areas or in an urban area, and season of acquisition. Now we will specifically look at um, pregnancy outcomes with refer reference to the maternal outcomes and the fetal outcomes. Um, maternal outcomes, we have an increase in miscarriages. Um, an analysis of pregnancy outcome in over 70,000 pregnant women in Thailand show a frequency of miscarriage in women without uh, malaria to be 19% and women with malaria to be 35% and which in um, Plasmodium falciparum and Vivax, the risk of miscarriage is the same. In anemia, 60% of women presenting with um, malaria will have anemia, and in, in hollow endemic areas, that's often your only sign of, of disease is the, is the anemia. Maternal mortality, the WHO estimates that 10,000 maternal deaths each year is associated with malaria infection. During pregnancy, I'm sorry, <laughs> study performed in Gambia showed a 168% increase in maternal mortality in the malaria season. So that's um, nearly a 200% increase in maternal mortality in that time. So fetal outcomes, we have low birth weight, perinatal mortality and congenital infection. Under low birth weight, there's preterm birth as well as fetal growth restriction or intrauterine growth restrictions. It's often diff difficult to, de to determine which one was the cause because we don't have certain gestation in, in most of the pregnancies. Um, but the fetal growth restriction is, is often caused by the placental disease of placental malaria because it decreases oxygen and nutrient transportation over the, over the placenta. And it's been shown to also increase your Doppler studies or show abnormal Doppler studies. The um, preterm birth is caused by cytokine release and the inflammatory response um, caused by the malaria parasite. The, a systematic review of 117 studies done between 1948 and 2002 showed an increase in perinatal mortality in 
malaria endemic areas versus non-endemic areas to be 61 versus 25 out of 100 live births. The congenital infection, you need placental infection to have congenital infection, but there's a lot of women that will have, congenit that will have placental disease without congenital infection, and it's often difficult to determine was it now a new acquired infection or was it a true congenital infection because it, you, it will um, happen 8 to 14 days post, postpartum. In 1943, Walt Disney produced a short film as propaganda against malaria, um, and the, the short film's name was Winged Scorch. Management of malaria in pregnancy. Uncomplicated malaria. The first trimester you'll use quinine and clindamycin for seven days. Um, in the second, second and third trimester, arthimetolephantrine will be used. In severe malaria, you'll use always use intravenous artisanate recommended for all trimesters. Um, if that is unavailable, you can use quinine and, and clindamycin, but you have to keep a close eye for hypoglycemia, which is often refractory to intravenous glucose. So you definitely need um, ICU care if someone is on IV quinine. Important considerations in pregnancy. In Uganda and Zim in Zambia, all pregnant women with malaria is managed as severe malaria and receives 48 hours of IV artisanate. So I'm working with two doctors from Zambia and Uganda at Kailicha, and they gave me this information, that that's how they manage all their pregnant ladies with, with um, malaria. There's a high risk of severe complications like hypoglycemia and pulmonary complications. And you must always consider supportive care where in an ICU where you can have strict fluid management, glucose monitoring, and urine output um, can be done properly. A big challenge in Africa is fake malarial drugs um, that they are trying their best to stop. Prevention, um, we can look at two, at two different sides of prevention, women living in endemic areas and people traveling through or to areas with malaria. A pregnant woman should be discouraged to travel to a country with malaria, and if that travel cannot be deferred, chemoprophylaxis with either chloroquine or mefloquine is advised. Chloroquine in areas that is not, does not have chloroquine resistance, mefloquine in areas that has chloroquine resistance, but mostly avoid endemic areas. Women living in endemic areas is advised to avoid mosquitoes. Um, Stay inside between dusk and dawn, covering exposed skin, insect repellent, and insecticide-treated nets. They also implement intermittent preventative treatment, which means that they all get treated with sulfadoxine, pyrimethine, um, three doses at 24 to 26 weeks, at 32 weeks, and 36 to 38 weeks. There is now an increase of drug resistance, and an alternative drug is dihydroarthrotamicin, pepraquin, um, and then an alternative to intermittent preventative treatment during pregnancy is intermittent screening and treatment, um, especially in areas where it's not um, hollow endemic or where there is a lot of um, drug resistance. You can consider intermittent screening and, and treatment, which entails that you get a, a malaria test at each antenatal visit, and once the infection has been confirmed, you only get treated according to the other guidelines. In HIV co-infection, if a patient is taking clotrimoxazole to prevent opportunistic infection, no further preventative treatment is needed, as that will cover for malaria. But if, it is, if the patient is not on Bactrim, more intensive um, intermittent preventative treatment is needed to prevent placental malaria. Um, so they would, would definitely rather be on the three doses or monthly doses um, of sulfadoxine, pyrimethine. Um, then initially they considered a two-dose regime. So this is just an a, a advert or a thing from um, how they try to make it simple for the patients that they know exactly what to do. So. So sleeps under an insecticide-treated net. 
take a first dose of Fansida, that's the trade name, when you feel your baby move, and take a second dose one month later. So that was initially when they used the two-dose regime to um, implement intermittent preventative treatment. In summary, pregnancy increased the risk of acquiring malaria infection and also increased the risk of more severe disease. Malaria significantly increased maternal and perinatal mortality rates, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. One should always have a high index of suspicion when treating a febrile pregnant woman who has, recently, uh, has a recent travel history, and the correct treatment should be started without delay and clinical response should be monitored. Malaria is 100% preventable and 100% treatable. Thank you very much. They've seen a, a patient at Kailicha eight months after returning from where she stayed in um, Gawana somewhere and with pulse, plasmodium falciparum, which is not supposed to be um, do dormant and which they th think could have been attracted from South Africa. You can even put in quite a bit of work to get the spot that you sorted out. Any questions for anything that she has? Not because she's shown that talk as well on that, so there might be something that she would have said that you could ask her about as well. Uh, yeah? Thank you very much, Lee. That was very interesting. I just want to ask a question. I think you said in Zambia um, that in the, in, the, in the malaria season, the maternal mortality goes up by 160%. Do you think that, that malaria is an explanation or can there be another explanation? But I think in that study they've attributed that to specifically malaria. It's in Gambia. Um, how I understand that what the article said was that it was secondary to malaria. Yeah, I'm just asking about the intermittent prophylaxis. We used to do that in Malawi all the time. We do the 20 to 36 weeks fancy down um, for the percent of parasitemia. Um, and is that still, because you say there's a lot of um, resistance now against fancy down. Do we, still, do we still do that? Yes, they still use fancy down. Um, what I didn't point out is that it it will um, decrease the placental load of the parasite, but also give six weeks of um, prophylaxis. So it covers quite a bit of the pregnancy. They still do, after speaking to the other um, guys from Africa, they still give Fansida. No, they don't. I don't or the things that I read, they never said anything about post postpartum um, intermittent preventative treatment. Yes. Postpartum as well. For 60 days. Yes. So, I just wanted to pose a question on to Dr. Kunyari, who qualified it, but I'm asking how much malaria they see if it's um, in pregnancy, closer to the action or the danger area. It was too common, but I think it was more common to use it from the core way up north, but uh, in pregnancy. In pregnancy. But uh, I don't know if it wasn't much confusing, but it's not an origin, by the way. I think we have all this access and the questions now. We have to look at this more Just to the are also the parasite that we have all the small ones that go in from the mosquito to the sporozoites. Sporozoites. Actually come from the salivary it's produced in the mid gut and then it gets injected through the salivary veins. So that actually makes sense because you can just imagine how small the mosquito slide actually how sensitive the sites that can fit through the Yes. 
But he, the mosquito doesn't get any illness, Prof. So he's actually gone quite lightly off it. He is the bad guy. <laughs> Questions. I'm sure you can contact me to the end of the future as well. If there's anything about Mary coming up, because I'm sure I want to really recently see. So, we'll ask you again. Thanks a lot for doing this all together. She was at she's got a chat about me, so we had a telephonic thing, and she did